First thing I got to do is say Happy Easter. Thank you. You didn't even have to say it back, but I just wanted to say that to you. Uh, all of you fusion students, I want to say happy to Easter to you too. Rock on today. Learn about who this God is in your life. Thank you. Hey, I want to welcome you. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm the pastor here and uh, one of the pastors. And just an honor and a privilege really to, to be called by a God who is way, 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 way bigger than me and, uh, and, and this even. And uh, it's, it's pretty crazy what that God can do in our lives and what wishes to do. So it's out of humility that I get to say that all this is for God today and everything that we do um, is just out of praise for this life. Um, if you are our guest or whether you are Horizons, I'm just, just blown away that we get to celebrate a day like this today. And so I want to welcome you today. Um, one of the things I want everyone to know is that uh, one of the reasons why I think this is a cool worship service this morning for Easter is that most of what you see happening this morning, besides the beautiful lilies, um, happens every Sunday. We might have turned up the sound levels just a notch today. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> but beyond that, uh, this is pretty much what you get. A community that's, uh, we're just, we're being honest about seeking God, about trying to walk closer to this. And I love that first song that we sang that was not, Lord, my heart's already on fire, but God, like, let me continue to be on fire for you. Let me continue to grow in that direction. Because I don't teach anything, and nothing comes across this, this stage that our leadership, that I'm not working on myself. And that's the first thing that we wanted to say today, is let us continue to draw near, or maybe, or maybe come back around and get a, a bit of a running start as we rediscover what Jesus' life is like living in our lives. Knowing that all of us here are broken people, that we've got plenty of stuff that drags us down or that holds us back, the main things that we do here is that we strive to connect with each other, with Christ in a meaningful and, and authentic way. We, we strive to grow through God's Word and, and letting this thing break our hearts sometimes and really hold us up in other times. And then learning to lead. That's one of the scariest things, but God gives us each these beautiful gifts that even just through a simple gesture of a smile can begin to change others' lives because we're life-changed, life-changers. So again, I want to welcome you this morning. Now, the thing is that we get to say Happy Easter and we get to say that Christ has risen, the Lord has risen, Jesus has come out of the grave and is no longer dead, no longer held back in that darkness. But I think the main power in today's teaching for us today lies not just within the end of the sentence, but within the details. I want you to think about these disciples. We know that Mary Magdalene plays a very important role uh, according to John's record, his, uh, his gospel this morning. And then also Peter, and we believe it's the uh, disciple John, who uh, the, the, he's the one that Peter has a foot race with, if you heard that earlier today. Um, but I want you to think about what's going on here. Uh, I like to give the disciples a lot of room, a lot of credit, because they're a lot like us. But I'm kind of wondering why it took so long for them to have this instantaneous reaction of, he's no longer in the grave, and pow, he's risen. And pow, like this instantaneous, uh, like, like just forward thrust that the disciples finally get to see everything that Jesus said actually is true. In my mind, and maybe in our minds, we would imagine that it would happen that instantly. Because they walked with Jesus every day. How could this be a mystery? But as you heard, Mary walks up to the tomb, and, uh, and her conclusion, after seeing that it's empty, is that someone has stolen Jesus' body. Now, Peter and John, they look in, they're confused, and they're also concluding someone has taken Jesus' body. Now, New Living Translation says that they finally kind of get it, but I think they kind of get it as we often kind of get it. We know that Jesus has risen, but if you, it, at the same time, we look deep into our hearts and we say, yeah, but I don't know exactly what that means in the depth of who I am or, or how my life is. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I'm all the way there. I get it up here. And then Mary even comes back a third time, or a second time, and she's just kind of hanging out in the garden. And even when she sees the angels in the tomb, you would think that would be a dead giveaway. Like, 
oh, I get it. Like, God's angels are here, and the cloths are empty, and the tomb is empty, the stolen's been rolled away. Ah, he's risen. Instead, Mary and the disciples are still lost. And it isn't until Mary walks out and then approaches the gardener as if he would know where the body is gone, not even realizing that she's face to face with Jesus because she's still just like, just above, like the waters are above her head in terms of what's going on here. And finally, it's that moment when Jesus, uh, you, can, you can say what you want, either kind of shakes her or breaks her from that trance, and, and he says, Mary. Mary, he says her name. And finally, she begins to get it. But I don't think she quite gets it, because Jesus says, whoa, 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 don't hold on. Don't try to stay in the past. Go forward. Keep going. I'm wondering why they didn't get it. I mean, I think I actually do get it, and I'm going to tell you why. But if you think about it, they had three encounters of really unusual things. Angels appearing, the stone rolled away, the claws are laying in a certain way that we are told that it is, it is actually a sign that Jesus was risen, not just taken out. Jesus even told the disciples, we are, it is recorded seven times, three times really, really, really plainly, and then four times it's kind of made reference to in scriptures. And so if we know it's in scriptures that there were several accounts, probably even beyond that, where Jesus told the disciples, look, here's what's going to happen. The Son of God, the Son of Man, which is me, Jesus says, uh, is going to be handed over to the authorities, which is the bad people that we've been trying to change their minds, okay? You know, he's painting this picture, and then he says, and by the way, they're going to do some really hateful things, and, and eventually they're going to kill him, and he's going to be in the grave for three days, and then the Son of Man will rise on the third day. Jesus said that, uh, not quite in the same words I'm using this morning, but really close. And uh, so you'd think that disciples would get it, right? Instead, they're like, oh, he's been, his body's been stolen. Now, think about it. Who would want to steal rotting flesh? Only the Jews, only the disciples would maybe have an interest in that. This is before stealing uh, bones of the martyrs was, became a thing because people believed there was power in the bones. Th that was before this, or this was before that. Who would want to steal it? There were actually Roman guards in front of the tomb so that the disciples wouldn't come and steal the bones. They wanted the body to stay in that grave because they were afraid that if the disciples came and stole Jesus' body away, then they could come back and say, look, he's gone. And yet the disciples were insisting that it was more likely that Jesus' body was stolen then it was likely that Jesus had actually raised, risen from the dead. In their mind, that was more of a possible thing than Jesus actually defeating death and coming out of that grave. And I kind of get it a little bit more. Because if we look at Jesus' life, and we look at the, the power that he promised and, and a lot of the, uh, the things that he foretold of saying this is going to happen. God is, will be glorified and no one will be mistaken that this is the Son of Man who comes full of glory. Jesus told the disciples that so many times and yet Jesus' ministry up to the point that he is nailed to a cross and laid in a tomb uh, to a lot of the disciples and a lot of the Jewish people around, Jesus never really fulfilled the promise that they believed was coming as a second coming of King David. Now, if you remember with me quickly, King David was a king who came in and was victorious and defeated the nations and the enemies around him through sword, through battle, through uh, fierce competition. They were waiting for Jesus to do the same because they interpreted the scriptures to say that was what was going to happen. And as they watched this Savior and this Messiah uh, in a rather victorious, that's not a word, but lacking victory, go to his death. <laughs> I use a lot of things that aren't words, but it happens when you're excited. <laughs> but when they watched all this happen, you have to imagine that they were a little bit disillusioned as they said, okay, then maybe Jesus isn't powerful enough to do that. And as they watched Jesus, 
receive insult and insult, both physically and emotionally, from the people that hated him the most. And as he on the cross said, Father, forgive them, not Father, take revenge on these people who were hating me, as they watched Jesus it simply seem to surrender and lay down his life. There's a chance the disciples were concluding that maybe this guy doesn't have that ability to really make true on the promises that were in Scripture. And as he finally died, and nothing really, really earth-shaking, besides an earthquake and the veil was torn, um, happened in a more, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. When nothing ha more than that happened, the disciples, how could they have thought anything was, more was possible? It seems very plausible then that they would conclude that the body was stolen because Jesus actually rising from the dead didn't seem likely at all. You see, in that moment, the disciples were most likely reflecting and saying, uh, what Jesus promised, what this man Jesus promised, did not look at all what we were expecting, how he lived his life and how he taught and how he responded to these things was not at all how it would have been if we were controlling the story and his timing on things, absolutely not along our timeline. So why would they expect that suddenly Jesus would start fulfilling some of those promises? So they walked away confused. They walked away saying, we don't know what's going on. I love this story, though, because it continues, and it speaks to us. You see, we say that Jesus has risen today, and we say Happy Easter, and we want to believe it, and there are a lot of us who are absolutely on cloud 10,000 right now saying, it is so true, and I know it, and I can feel it, and I have lived it to my bone, to the very core of who I am. But there are a lot of us saying, okay, so I'm saying Happy Easter, but I'm not sure I really get it. I'm not sure my life has really shown or experienced the evidence of Jesus' power, of Jesus' new life, of Jesus' resurrection. And in a lot of ways, we're just like the disciples. Because even today, how Jesus lives in the world, what he is doing in response to our agony, our suffering, and our incompleteness, and how Jesus is going about showing himself to be the ultimate ruler and the ultimate king and lord of our lives today, and in his impeccable timing, we continue to struggle with whether this is true, whether this is real, whether this is powerful, as powerful as we say. Because Jesus isn't doing things, isn't doing what we thought, how we thought, or when we thought. And so as we hear these words, he is risen, we often respond in just the same ways as the disciples did. It took them a while, and they were a little bit unsure. But I love how this story continues because the disciples demonstrate how this resurrection, how this new life thing works. You see, in, in, in the instant of a flash, sometimes our lives are changed, and yet oftentimes in the instant of a very slow process, our lives are changed in even more powerful ways, just as it happened to the disciples. You would have thought that eventually, as Mary... As Mary uh, saw Jesus face to face that as she like ran home to the disciples and said, guys, he really is risen. I just saw him face to face. I, I, I'm not kidding you. You would have think that things would have changed right there. But instead of the disciples welcoming her like, Come there, there, calm down, Mary. Uh, you just a little excited. It was just a dream or a vision. You didn't really see him. Jesus actually isn't alive. You know, there, there, there. You would think that after Peter and John uh, finally began to see what was going on, that they too, that would have brought that news home and the disciples would have said, that's it. Now we know that he actually has risen and his body hasn't been stolen. But as Mary, Peter, John bring back the news, nothing happens. The disciples don't move. They don't break free from where they are. You hear of no good news coming out of them. So I love this story because essentially what Jesus does is he asks of us three things. Now, the first thing is that Jesus, uh, in order to experience this, uh, this, this new life, this resurrection, 
the first thing, and, and Danny, there's a slide for this. I know I'm just going to just keep you going all morning this morning. Um, the first thing is that Jesus first has to shake us. First has to break us. This is in your worship outline this morning, this morning. Um, forgot to tell you about that worship outline. It's on the back of your program. The resurrection doesn't care about all the formalities, by the way. That the first thing for us to experience this resurrection is that Jesus breaks us free. When Jesus looked at Mary in the garden and said her name, Mary, she began to be broken free from her sorrows, from her inward looking, from her loss. And she began to see that it was true, even beyond all the doubts that Jesus had risen. Now, the second thing is what I like to call reconfiguration, or when Jesus actually redirects our original approaches and our original uh, practices and responses. And we can see that in how the disciples are responding. They need redirected because the disciples uh, are all kind of still looking inward. They're holding on to the past. That's why Jesus says, Mary, don't hold on to me. Because what happens after the disciples bring back the good news and nothing happens, Jesus shows up in the upper room. See, they, they met and they continued to pray and they closed all the drapes and they locked all the doors so that when no one would find out that they were still meeting. And Jesus shows up and he says, look, you can see the holes in my arms. You can see the holes in my feet and the hole in my side. I have risen. I have defeated the grave. Your sins came with me and you are free. Jesus said that to the di disciples and you would, could imagine in that room they would see them. They'd be like, now it's true. Now we know. Nothing happened. No response. Now Thomas wasn't there that morning that Jesus showed up in the, in the upper room. So then we're told in John's gospel that Jesus shows up again. At that time Thomas is there. And he says, look, Thomas. Because Thomas was like, I don't, I'm not going to believe it unless I see it for myself. So he says, look, Thomas, put your, put your fingers in here. You're not just seeing things. And he says, go and believe and tell people. You think that that was the moment then they would be broken free and they would say, now we know that he is risen and now we can go and we can do uh, what needs to be done. They don't. See how this thing works? It takes time. Nothing happens. We know that nothing happens and we know that the disciples continue to hold on to the past or even let go of hope because the next time that we hear that Jesus visits the disciples, he visits them as they're out fishing in a boat. Many of the disciples were fishermen before they agreed to follow Jesus and fish for people. But as they lose their hope, they begin to go back to what they know. And they're out in the boat and they fished all night and didn't catch a single stinking fish. Injury to insult. Jesus is gone, and now they don't even remember how to fish. They're holding on to the past. It doesn't matter that Jesus has proven his resurrection so many times already. They don't quite get it. Like, we don't quite get it sometimes. Finally, one of them, as Jesus yells out to him and says, Hey, maybe you should throw your nets out on the other side of the boat. And they're like, We did that already. Peter starts to realize that's, that might be the Lord. He jumps out of the boat, swims to the shore. Jesus has this glorious fire going for them. They bring in all this fish that they can barely contain because there's more of a catch than they ever imagined was possible, especially after a whole night of fishing. And Jesus takes the bread that he's been baking on this fire and the fish, and he breaks it. And finally, they're starting to see, they see that it's the Lord, Scripture says, but no one's brave enough to actually say, Lord, is that you? And they're sitting around, and they can tell that this is the Lord. And, and now Peter is sitting next to Jesus, and Jesus kind of nudges, nudges Peter, and he says, Hey, Peter, Simon Peter, he's like, do you love me more than these? And he wasn't saying... Hey, Peter, um, are you better than everyone in this room? Do you, do you love me more than they love me? He's saying, Peter, do you love the Son of God more than you're loving what's in front of you, what's out here on earth? Now, Peter, the last time Jesus and Peter really had a t conversation was when uh, Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny Jesus three times. And then Peter's like, no, nah, that would never happen. And then he goes and denies Jesus three times and weeps bitterly because he realized what he had just done. He says, I don't know that guy. 
That's the last that Peter has, that we've heard from Peter. And so for Peter to be confronted by Jesus in that way, he says, Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I do, Lord. I, I really screwed up, but you know I do. And Peter says, and Jesus says, feed my sheep. Then he says, Peter, do you, are you sure you love me? And, and Peter says, you know I do. He says, feed my sheep. Third time, Jesus says, hey man, you sure you love me? Peter, do you love me? And he says, Lord, why do you keep asking? You know I do. This is starting to really uh, hurt me. And he says, feed my sheep. You see, the first thing that Jesus does to our lives so that we, we begin to con- understand the resurrection is he begins to shake or break us from our sorrow, our inward looking. The second thing that he does is he begins to ask us to reconfigure our lives, our approaches, our responses, to redirect our lives. You see, the whole time the disciples were waiting for Jesus to make everything good again and restore everything so they could quit being sad and quit worrying. But every time Jesus showed up, whether it was with Mary or the disciples without Thomas or the disciples with Thomas or with Peter and everyone else on the, on the sandy shore eating fish, Jesus said, go and tell people. Go and feed my sheep. Go do something about it. Quit just waiting for it all to come to you. If you want the resurrection to be in your life first, you have to seek Jesus shaking. You can't control when Jesus is going to shake or break you free from that. I wish I had a a way that I could invite each one of you into my office. We could light a candle and say, boom, Jesus, shake this person free from their life. But we can seek it. The second thing is that we let our lives be redirected. The disciples realized that they couldn't just sit around and wait for Jesus to come. They had to go out into the world and participate in it. Our lives are a lot like that, aren't they? We don't get it. And we're just trying to get back to where things were good. Now I invite each of us to seek that, to seek God, to, to Jesus, to break us free. But I also encourage each of us to begin to learn to participate. We look around our world today and it's just like the disciples. We're looking at a world that is still full of hurt and destruction. We're looking at a world that is currently still mourning the death of 147 Christians at a Christian university in Kenya getting killed because of their beliefs. And then we're struggling, rightfully so, with the resurrection. We're living in a world that's still rampant with addiction, with broken marriages, with teen suicide with really hurtful things, with emptiness that never seems to be filled by anything in our world. And now we can relate to the disciples who aren't quite sure that it's even likely that Jesus could rise from the dead. We're still aching. And yet Jesus says, seek to be broken. And allow your life to start being redirected. That you're not just living in your own sorrow and your own hurt but participate in this resurrection. Now the third thing that Jesus does, and this is on your worship outline as well, is that Jesus then invites us to embrace, to embrace a renewal, only his renewal. We're going to go to that slide for John chapter 2, and this renewal. You see, we now know the story. We've been told that we have this entire direction of Jesus from beginning to all the way to his resurrection and his new life. And now as we go forward, like the disciples who became apostles, who became the people of the early church, who then passed on the message, who then told other people, invited other people, and who decided to live it, and then who through time came to this very point that now we see the body of Christ before us today in so many places, we get to take that story with us as well. Jesus' whole story. And so as the apostles went into the early church and started saying, okay, we absolutely know that the Lord has risen. We have seen it seven times. Jesus came back again and again and again until we finally got it, until it finally sunk into our lives. And now hear the story, the good news, the gospel of Jesus. And I love how in John's gospel, the very first sign, the very first miracle that we get to remember, that we get to celebrate, is of Jesus hanging out a wedding and blessing 
the people at that wedding. That's the very first thing he does according to John's gospel. And we take that story with us because what Jesus does in that moment is he makes everything new. It's a sign for the people there who are just beginning to learn who this Jesus is. It's a sign that water, which we're told quenches our thirst, that we will thirst no more, is then turned into wine, which not only quenches our thirst, but quenches us from, from the sins that we carry, from the destruction that we have lived into. And so we're told in John's Gospel... Chapter 2, verse 13, it was nearly time for the Passover and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Well, that's not it. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so, I was getting too excited. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples were also invited into the celebration. When they ran out of wine, Jesus' mother said to him, they don't have any wine. Jesus replied, woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't yet come. So what Jesus does is he kind of slips away and he tells the slaves that were, the servants that were at the wedding, he says, okay, I know you're running out of wine. I want you to go down to the river and take these heavy pots and fill them full of water. And you have to imagine the servants are like, what is this crazy dude saying? Like, we're going to water down the wine and what, like, how is this going to work? We're all going to get in a lot of trouble. But in that moment, Jesus asks for God's blessing, turns this water into wine, and then signifies to everyone who is watching, especially those who are going to become his disciples, I am the one who makes all things new. Water into wine. Wine that eventually becomes the symbol of Jesus' blood that we just celebrate and acknowledge was spilled, but then redeemed through a resurrection through a busting out of the grave, through an overcoming of death, of hatred, through an overcoming of the chains that wish to hold us down, to steal life away from us. And so as Jesus turned that water into wine, the master of the ceremony stopped all the music and all the dancing, and he said, I want you all to know something. Most people serve the good wine first, and when everyone gets really doused, then they bring out the really crummy stuff because no one's going to notice. He says, but not here. For whatever reason, you have saved the best for last. This is good wine, the Master of Ceremony says. And so we see today that the best wasn't given to us first and then given to us in mediocre amounts and qualities for the rest of our lives that the best was saved for when we needed it the most. And so we are invited to be a part of this new day as we seek, as we seek Jesus' breaking of our lives, breaking us free, as we welcome his redirection, that we begin to not only wait for it to come to us, that we begin to participate in it and as we allow our lives to be renewed and refilled. So today, we, as we gather, we lift up this bread, which is a sign of what Jesus did for us. Let his body be broken before us and for us, that it might become for us the sustenance of our lives, the bread of life, that we might take it and eat it, be filled, restored, renewed, and that today we might celebrate what Jesus has done in his death and in his resurrection by taking this cup, by holding it up, by giving thanks for it, and allowing it to be the sign of that blood that was spilled that then washed over us, cleanses us of our sins, and gives us new life. Today we celebrate this through the act of communion. If you are striving, whether you are our guest or whether you are Horizons, if you are striving to believe in these things, if your heart is open, wanting them to be true, you are welcome to communion. It is free for everyone because this is Christ's table, not ours. And so we invite you to join in that this morning. As we go forward, I invite each of us to, to join in prayer and want to remind you that the Lord's Prayer is on the screen in case you need uh, a reminder of the words. Let us pray.